myself, Agresso Bellino from EPI. I also a member of the University of the Philippines Culture Mass Communication Foundation Incorporated, a uh, member of uh, the PCS Philippines Communication Society, and the uh, uh, Philippine Association for Media Information Literacy, and among other things. Maraming salamat everyone for being here. Probably, and dami yung na, na, na attend the seminar ano, hindi lang ito, but uh, I can see familiar cases. I heard there are 319 registrants, and it's still impossible for me to introduce or mention all of your names, but I can see familiar faces. Probably I've met them in the other webinars at with organized the PPI or some other organizations that organize them. But uh, of the 319 who actually registered, those who will be admitted in the mid in this meet room will be 250 only. So shout out to those who are watching on Facebook Live right now. So please, please, please enjoy this. Uh, it's an understatement. Enjoy, laugh for better than enjoy this webinar because uh, there's much to say about media freedom in the time of the pandemic. This particular webinar or online seminar is being brought to you by jointly organized by the University of the Philippines College of Mass Communication Foundation Incorporated the Philippine Social Science Council, and the Philippine Press Institute with support from the ever-dependable Nickel Asia Corporation, also the principal partner of the Philippine Press Institute for our so many seminars, past and present. And uh, uh, to officially welcome us all and to start the ball rolling, I'd like to call uh, one person who makes all these things possible, I'm part of the team, and who greatly made an effort to really uh, make this webinar happen. She is going to welcome us all, is Dr. Arminda B. Santiago. Professor Arminda B. Santiago is a tenured faculty member at the College of Mass Communication, University of the Philippines in Diliman, where she is the current dean. She is also an affiliate faculty member with the Faculty of Information and Communication Studies serving in the Doctor of Communication program of the University of the Philippines Open University. She is also the head of production of TVUP, the internet television station of the University of the Philippines system. Professor Santiago has 35 years of experience in teaching courses in communication, media, and film studies to undergraduate and graduate students. She also has an extensive experience in film and video production work and management, communication and media campaign planning, IEC and audiovisual management, academic program management, curriculum planning and development, development and production of IEC and multimedia production materials and events organization and management. Please welcome Team Arminda Santiago. Hello uh, everyone. Uh... It's a pleasant day for uh, for this uh, day of uh, knowledge production, and uh, I hope that uh, everybody is fine and in good health and COVID nineteen safe. So uh, today we'll be hearing a lot of uh, and learning a lot of uh, information and knowledge from our esteemed speakers in the main uh, theme of. <clears throat> media freedom and responsibility in the time of the pandemic. As you all know, we are in a unique time and the reality that is brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, which calls for everyone to recognize and to adjust our ways of pursuing life in a new reality. We also have to somehow modify our behavior by adding in the way we do everyday chores the health protocols that have been tested by time to work on preventing us from getting sick. It is like going back to our childhood days when our parents would remind us to wash our hands with soap and water before eating, among other things. Only this time, there is a frequency to doing this simple task. And then there's the addition of wearing a face mask something that we see only doctors wear in the hospitals. But now we have to wear them as well to protect ourselves. And then there's this wearing a face shield that is a suffocating gear. 
And added to that, the physical distance from people with varying measurements of distance. Is it three feet? Is it six feet or more? But then in the reality of life, especially among Filipinos, because we are a group uh, kind of a, a group kind of a society. So people still flock to each other without benefit of a semblance of distance. And in looking at the bigger picture of this new reality, it cannot be denied that in mitigating the spread of the disease, our government is playing a lead role in implementing various restrictions that it believes or would like to believe that their measures are effective and are for the greater good. Essentially, the government is perceived to be a controller and in such mindset, it is saddening that basic human rights are violated. Such violations are all in the name of protecting the Filipino people from an invisible enemy that not even medical professionals and scientists have much knowledge about this invader. And on top of this, we have to contend with the conflicting information about the virus, about the disease, as well as the data or data on the number of cases, recoveries, and deaths. And I'm sure you have experienced this whenever they uh, give the updates about uh, statistics on the cases, the cases, are they fresh, are they active, are they stale, if ever there's such a term, recoveries and deaths. It's good to know that in the Philippines, we always um, are informed about recoveries. Unlike in other countries, like in the United States, uh, they only talk about cases and then deaths. At least we are more optimistic here that we also talk about how many have recovered from the disease. But what is disturbing in our horizon of events is the way government is controlling this narrative about the pandemic and the role that the mass media or media in general plays. With or without the pandemic, the media should be able to fulfill its mandate to democracy and to the people through a critical press that challenges the status quo, fact checks, and counter propaganda to protect and preserve our constitutionally enshrined freedom of expression, speech, and of the press. We as media recognize the power of narrative and we respect this power by being responsible as well as being sensitive to the times. I welcome you to this forum webinar on media freedom and responsibility in the time of pandemic. And thank you for giving your time and lending an ear and having this mindset to learn more about this aspect that also affects how media performs its mandate. So thank you very much. And we give you a virtual hug for this forum webinar. Are you? I have, okay, I have to unmute myself, okay. So everybody does that all the time, but you know, sometimes we forget. Okay, maraming salamat in army for setting the tone of this webinar and a shout out to those who are on Facebook Live, shout out to the participants watching right now and the videos being shared by some other individuals and hi again to uh, the participants in this meeting room who just came in. We are expecting 250 packs out of the 319 who actually registered. Have been mentioned about Nickel Asia Corporation which is actually supporting this program. Let's hear a a welcome address or a message from, uh, from one of our friends in the industry, uh, my good friend, and, and a lot of you know him. He is currently the Vice President for Corporate Communications at Nickel Asia Corporation, a public affairs commentator and columnist at Malaya newspaper. He is a product of UP from preschool all the way to the UP College of Law, very loyal, a single father, of two boys from different mothers, Hayden, the Shih Tzu, 
and Apollo, the Maltese, I can relate. Please welcome the indefatigable Mr. Jose Bayano, J.D. Bailon. Um, thank you, Ariel Dean. Good uh, afternoon. Also to E.D. Risa and the first ambassador. Um, I'm happy to be here today uh, on a professional and a personal level. No? On a professional level, as representative of Nickel Asia, um, which is a company committed to corporate citizenship, understanding that uh, the many problems of the country cannot be addressed by government alone, but uh, can only be addressed by a concerted effort of all sectors, including us in the private sector. Um, and therefore, beyond our own communities and our industry, we are more than happy to support um, activities like this, as we have supported PPI for the last few years, and of course, happily supporting the College of Mass Communication. On a personal level, um, I am also very keen on uh, activities like these because I firmly believe uh, that um, one of the most important obligations of a Filipino is his citizenship. Now, of course, what is citizenship unless it is informed citizenship, um, which will require informed choice? And how can a Filipino um, learn more about his choices except through a free press? Uh, in a couple of times I've written uh, in my columns, which only my father used to read, um, that one of the problems of the Philippines today is a citizenship which I call inert. How many Philippines, for example, have even read the Constitution, except for those like me who had to do that in law school or some in political science? Um, how many Filipinos actually have read it? Uh, it's The Constitution, you must remember, is like your organizational rules, which you read and sometimes memorize when you join a professional organization. The Constitution is the rules of your being a citizen. And in those who have read the Constitution, how many understand the fact that there's a reason why it was written the way it was written? You have the Bill of Rights first, you have the legislature second, you have the executive third, you have the judiciary fourth, and then you have constitutional commissions. There is a reason why these were written in this order. But we forget. And now we always revert to um, special powers for the president or emergency rule, etc., etc. And so when uh, opportunities like these arise, you know, for both Nicolaitis and myself to be supportive of efforts to boost uh, or share or, or, or make our citizens aware of the importance of media freedom, we don't think twice. Um, and that's why we're happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. And uh, while I will switch off my camera so as not to distract others, I will be tuned in until 5 p.m. And I look forward to being more supportive of further activities because we have to keep this up beyond the pandemic. When we face 2022, when we have to choose a successor to PRRD, we have to continue being able to discuss the real issues of the day so that when citizens go to the polls and exercise their most sacred right, they will exercise it as informed citizens of the country. Thank you very much and have a good day. Maraming salamat, Sir JB. <clears throat> Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Maraming salamat. Hats off to Nickel Asia Corporation for really extending its services. And I salute the men and women behind uh, or in Nickel Asia Corporation for going out of their way to support uh, our colleagues in the media industry. Um, thank you for the assurance of support in the future activities. We are honored to have with us His, excellent, ex His Excellency, the British Ambassador to the Philippines, Ambassador Daniel Cruz, who is going to give us his message. The British Embassy has also been at the helm of uh, media freedom programs, which one of well, at least one or two I've attended uh, as resource persons in the past this year. So Ambassador Daniel Cruz, was appointed as ambassador to the Philippines in August 2017. Previously, he was deputy head of mission at the British Embassy in Madrid from 2012 to 2016 and British Embassy in Bangkok from 2008 to 2012. Before that, he worked in the Europe Directorate of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London, heading the department that dealt with internal EU issues, including economic reform, and the EU's institutions. He was also responsible for strategic communications in the EU, including the Lisbon Treaty. From 
from 2004 until 2005, Ambassador Daniel was the program director of the FCO's change program, the organization project. This included restructuring or restructuring rather the FCO in London and overseas. Ambassador Daniel was seconded to the Prime Minister's press office in 10 Downing Street from 2002 to 2004, responsible for briefing journalists on foreign defense and development issues and accompanying then Prime Minister Tony Blair on his visits overseas. He has twice worked in the UK's permanent representative to the EU in Brussels. First, dealing with closing stages of the GAP, Uruguay round negotiations from 1993 to 1996. Then as British spokesperson on EU issues from 1999 to 2001. Ambassador Cruz was seconded to NATO headquarters during the Kosovo crisis in 1999. During this period, Ambassador Daniel also spent time in Macedonia working with the NATO communications. And please welcome His Excellency Ambassador, British Ambassador Daniel Cruz. Uh, Magandang Harpong, thank you very much for that introduction and it's a great pleasure to be able to join you at the start of your discussions uh, this afternoon. Um, as other uh, speakers have said, you know, we are living uh, very much in a unique uh, and challenging time where the coronavirus has not only reshaped the way we live and learn and work, but it's also reshaping the way our societies and our citizens uh, access information uh, and facts and information are, are so important at this time. Uh, sadly, we're also seeing during this period uh, an increase in the level of disinformation, fake news and, and press censorship. Uh, indeed, the, the index on censorship verified that something like 240 incidents of attacks against journalists have taken place globally during this pandemic, from, from crackdowns to arrests, from restrictions on reporting uh, to the use of emergency legislation to restrict uh, the usual media freedoms that journalists, broadcasters would use to be able to go about their, their profession. Uh, of course, the coronavirus has also impacted on media outlets as you know, the economic damage has been felt by uh, sectors across the board. Um, the media, journalism have not been uh, exempt from that. And we've also seen how in the context of the pandemic that uh, inequalities in, in newsrooms have been brought into focus as well. The International Federation of Journalists uh, shows that the COVID-19 crisis has had a negative impact on uh, women's salaries, as well as on their work responsibilities, career advancement and private life, more so than their male counterparts. We are in a point where having access to, to verified and accurate information uh, genuinely becomes a matter of life and death. And the role of press as fact checker and watchdog is extremely important. As we see the media freedom landscape globally uh, starting to worsen as a result of the pandemic, it's all the more important to uphold uh, media freedom as a vital component of any functioning democracy uh, and the, the bedrock, the foundation stone of the other rights that we enjoy as members of free democratic societies. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, as you'll know, has been leading a global campaign for media freedom uh, this year and last year, uh, and we remain committed to ensuring that that campaign uh, brings a genuine uh, series of positive benefits to journalists around the world seeking to do their job safely, free from harassment and intimidation, and that those in power can be properly held to account and that there is a legislative framework in place uh, to ensure uh, the proper application of law uh, in this area uh, across the world. Here in the Philippines, one of the projects we're supporting uh, this year focuses on fighting uh, misinformation and disinformation at the time of COVID-19. 
Uh, that's an important project that we are pleased to be associated with. Uh, and we're also looking forward to the uh, implementation of the Philippines Plan of Action on the safety of journalists and helping to make that implementation a, a reality. This is one of the first national action plans of its kind in the world and is, uh, I think, tribute to what uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, can achieve. Uh, we're also, as an embassy, working hard to provide various training for journalists and promoting media literacy in, in different schools and universities across the country. Uh, we have our own scholarship, the Media Freedom Achieving Scholarship, which uh, gives the, uh, the best, uh, brightest uh, young journalists here in the Philippines an opportunity uh, to study in the UK. Uh, I think just before I conclude and, and wish you every success of your discussions this afternoon, uh, I think a personal reflection from myself, having as you as you spelt out, Ariel, in your very generous introduction, having myself worked as a, as a diplomat in the communications field for for many years. I think at you know at any time, uh, it's important for societies to be able to uh, have confidence that the the journalists who are holding the powerful to account are able to do that in a way which is uh, unfettered. Um, and I think when we are all in the midst of a global pandemic, citizens and societies need truth and transparency more than, more than ever. And media freedom, the confidence that our media is genuinely free uh, is the best guarantee that we will have access to the truth and the facts uh, that we all need. So I'll conclude on that reflection. I wish you every success of your discussions this afternoon. I'm sorry I can't stay for longer with you, but thank you very much for this opportunity to say a few words of introduction uh, at the beginning of the afternoon. Maraming salama. Thank you. Ambassador Bruce, thank you for joining us this afternoon, although you're not going to stay long, but really thank you for the support. And uh, more power to the progress of uh, UK on media, on media freedom or press freedom. At this point, I'd like to call the executive director of uh, the UK College of Mass Communication Foundation Incorporated, Maria Isabel Risa Silvert, is going to give the, in, the overview for this webinar. Over to you, Risa. Thank you, Ariel. Good afternoon, everyone. At the time when we are mirrored in worry, and uncertainty because of the coronavirus pandemic, free information is essential in helping us face, understand, think about and overcome this crisis. In times of lockdown and limited mobility, access to fair information and objective reporting, as well as the provision of information are critical and can be life-saving. Journalists are essential source of information for all of us. Thus, they have a huge responsibility to provide fair, objective, and well-informed reporting that is powered by research and critical analysis. All this is possible if media freedom exists. So the UP College of Mass Communication Foundation has teamed up with the Philippine Press Institute and the Philippine Social Science Council with the support, of course, of Nickel Asia Corporation to organize today's webinar, Media Freedom in Time of Pandemic. This webinar aims to raise awareness of the importance of media freedom and responsibility during this time of pandemic, to address any misinformation that may have been communicated in other media about the concept of the professional practice of journalism, to describe how information about the pandemic is handled and or mishandled by the government assigned interagency COVID-19 task force, and to provide a platform and a space for the various sectors to voice out their narratives and other information on the pandemic and the significance of having a free media in protecting democracy in the country. We are lucky to have distinguished speakers who are experts in their respective fields. Professor Danilo A. Arau, Assistant Professor, Department of Journalism, 
UP College of Mass Communication on reaffirming media freedom from government during the pandemic. Okay, next slide, please. Carolyn Argilles, editor in chief of Mindanus on the Mindanao narrative in the time of pandemic. And last but not the least, Ms. Tess Bacalia, Project Lead Asia Democracy Chronicles, media consultant, editor, independent journalist, and former executive director of Southeast Asian Press Alliance on the lowdown in disinformation during crisis. The webinar will run for two hours. So there is, of course, an open forum. So please prepare your questions, which will be read by the moderator, as these are given in the chat box and FB pages. You can view this webinar in the FB pages of the Philippine Press Institute, Philippine Social Science Council, and the UP College of Mass Communication Foundation. Thank you. Over to you, Ariel. Maraming salamat, Lisa. Shout out again to those who just came in, who just joined the meeting room, and those who are watching via Facebook Live. My name is Ariel Sabellino from the Philippine Press Institute. I'm going to be your host and moderator this afternoon. I was once asked, Ariel, what's the difference between having media freedom or press freedom or not having it before the pandemic and during the pande pandemic or even after the pandemic? Let's figure that, 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 that out. I was so stunned with the question, but uh, let's hear from our three competent resource persons. There are my friends in the industry and probably heard or listened to them a lot uh, in, in some seminars, but already. But as Risa said, they're experts in what they're doing. I'm going to introduce each one of them um, in, in, in order. So I'll start with profe Associate Professor. Danilo Arau uh, of the UPCMC Department of Journalism. He's also a special, special lecturer rather at the PUP, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines Department of Journalism. He is the editor of Media Asia, an international peer reviewed journal. He is also associate editor of Bulat Lat Multimedia, an online news magazine. His six most recent books are Objetivo Criticismo, the UPD Centro ng Bitong Filipino, that's 2020, that's current, of the current year. Kuro Kuro, website publishing, that's 2015. Hay Nako, Hay Nako, 2013. Sai Sai ng Pagkakaugnay Ugnay uh, by the USC Publishing House way back in 2012. Hay Buhay by the UP Press way back again in 2012. And Contra. Contra Texto by DLS or De La Salle uh, University Publishing House. We're looking to get in 2012. Please welcome Professor Danilo Arau, who is going to talk about reaffirming media freedom from government control during this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, magandang... Yeah, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Uh, itatanong ko lang po, uh, Ariel, nakikita na ba yung PowerPoint presentation? Oh, sige. Anyway, uh, kung nakikita nyo po siguro, uh, pasensya na po at yung teknolohiya eh, talagang uh, medyo naglilimita sa ating uh, personal na interaction at kahit sa isang guru at periodist ang katulad ko, mas mainam talaga yung tinatawag natin face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, pero sa pagkakataong ito, sa limitadong oras na ibinigay sa akin, uh, susubukan po nating uh, magbigay ng, ng ilang opinion tungkol sa sinasabi na media freedom. So the title of this presentation is Reaffirming Media Freedom. And uh, since I'm the first speaker, uh, I think it's appropriate that we discuss first what is media freedom. Because there are certain instances uh, where media freedom is made synonymous uh, with the term press freedom. To some extent, uh, there's some validity to making both terms synonymous, but when you think about it, media freedom is much broader in the sense that 
uh, it's supposed to include not just journalism, but also advertising, public relations, and entertainment. So this would partly explain why in the 1987 Constitution, as mentioned uh, by a colleague uh, who made the introduction, uh, the provision regarding freedom, regarding the protection of basic freedom goes beyond the issue of freedom uh, that should be enjoyed by journalists and media workers. So it includes protection uh, of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and of course, the right to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So that's one aspect of media freedom that would have to be clarified as early as now. And another point about press freedom is that we're not speaking in absolutes. It's not black and white uh, because there are certain limits to press freedom in terms of what the law provides and of course what we call normative standards that are imposed with regard to the practice of journalism, advertising and public relations, as well as entertainment. Uh, of course, I have to start with a caveat here. Just because it's written in the law, it doesn't mean that uh, it's already acceptable insofar as the practice of journalism is concerned. We've lived through the horrors of martial law from 1972 to 1986, and we're all aware that uh, certain uh, presidential decrees, certain policies that were imposed by the dictator at that time uh, worked against the interest of the media. And that's why uh, in the context of ethics, uh, during the time of martial law, it was the ethical obligation of uh, journalists and media workers to oppose the dictatorship. Because how can you practice journalism when the very laws themselves would end up restricting uh, the supposed uh, free atmosphere for uh, redress of grievances, for the exercise of basic freedoms, including press freedom. So that's why sometimes uh, in the course of Philippine history, journalists and media workers would, you know, uh, walk on a tightrope, so to speak, when it comes to looking at freedom on one hand and the law on the other. So that's where the normative standards of journalism become very important. Uh, this is not an open call, especially for journalism and communication students out there to, you know, wantonly violate the law in the guise of exercising your freedom. Far from it. That's not the point. The point here is we need to be very, very critical of laws that are existing right now and even pending bills in Congress that would tend to compromise press freedom. We don't just say, we don't tell our students, sumunod na lang kayo, total yun yung nakasulat sa batas. That would be irresponsible for any journalist or for, or for any uh, communication and journalism educator to tell students that particular point. Because uh, we want to tell students as early as now, you have to be very, very critical. And if necessary, you have to oppose and call for the junking of certain laws that would tend to compromise freedom. But under what parameters do we talk about freedom? It's not something subjective because normative standards of journalism, and when we say normative standards, it's not just code of ethics. It's also the professional standards of journalism, uh, like accuracy, brevity, uh, consistency, and all that. So these are... Uh, standards that have been with us for the for a very very long time now and these are the basis by which we try to exercise uh, journalism in an atmosphere of press freedom and if there are certain laws that would compromise such atmosphere then part of our obligation is again to oppose such uh, policies so that's why it's not surprising that through the years, we've seen journalists openly opposing certain repressive laws, like the Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012, or even way back, the Human Security Act of 2007. And if you want to look at certain laws that were passed in 2020 during the lockdown, 
there are petitions filed against the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. And not surprisingly, among the petitioners there would be journalists, media workers, and, you know, journalism and communication educators. So it is in that context that we talk about the non-absolute character of press freedom. Much as we give due respect to certain laws, for the most part, we oppose laws that would try to compromise freedom. Because after all, when we talk about media freedom, uh, it talks about responsibility. Okay? With great power comes that responsibility, that great responsibility to ensure that we are able to properly shape public opinion uh, through the responsible exercise uh, of the profession. So now that we've talked about uh, briefly what is meant by press freedom, uh, we want to zero in on press freedom. Why do we zero in on press freedom? Uh, it's not just because I'm a journalist and teacher, so that's why I'm biased for press freedom. So as we, know, as we noted a while ago, uh, media freedom includes journalism, advertising and public relations, and entertainment. Just quickly, when you talk about journalism ethics, it's the oldest and it's the most established set of ethical guidelines in media. Of course, we're not belittling the code of ethics in advertising, public relations, as well as entertainment. But if you look at the development of codes of ethics worldwide, the more established ones would be the ones that were uh, finalized and uh, crafted by various news media organizations pertaining to specific practices of journalism. So that's why press freedom is a major aspect of media freedom. So we're aware that press freedom is a cornerstone of democracy for two reasons. Number one, uh, for journalists, they are able to report and to interpret issues and events based on the professional and ethical standards. And number two, the news media organizations operate freely from government intervention. So the essence of press freedom uh, is basically for journalists on one hand to do what they need to do uh, in order to adhere to the necessary standards of the profession. But on the other hand, the other level that we have to look at would be the ability of a particular news media organization to not be subject to any government intervention that would result in the control of what gets published or what gets aired, because that would be utterly unacceptable. And in the process, uh, since we're discussing those two levels, uh, there are several elements of press freedom, but uh, for purposes of our discussion, we can focus just on two major key elements, which are editorial independence and self-regulation. Editorial independence in the sense that all news media organizations uh, should be able to craft their own programs, their own actions, uh, and their uh, own issues, uh, and they should be free from government intervention, as mentioned a while ago. And of course, a self-regulatory atmosphere uh, is also necessary, and that would partly explain why, uh, during the time of martial law, uh, there were many journalists and media workers that really opposed the dictatorship because it went against uh, the key elements of press freedom. There was no editorial independence because there was a board of censors then, uh, not just uh, covering news media organizations, but even filmmaking and other aspects of media. And of course, self-regulation was very much compromised uh, by the dictator at that particular time. Now, whether or not uh, the same case is happening right now, of course, uh, we have to look at uh, certain anecdotal evidence uh, regarding media repression uh, that we will discuss later on. Uh, so the other part of press freedom uh, has to do with its objective, which is to ensure that we can inform uh, the citizens and in the process, they would become critical uh, thinkers. So this is an important aspect of journalism because sometimes uh, people say that uh, when you do journalism, you're just there to report and then uh, it's up to the public to 
as to how they will absorb what you report. To some extent, there is some validity there, but uh, I don't mean to be too blatant, to be too blunt in my discourse here, but that's a bit conservative, uh, given the dire situation that we're in right now. The objective of journalism, if you go by the normative standards of the profession, would be to create a critical mass of audiences. If you're not able to make your if you're not able to make your audience think, then there is something lacking in your journalistic output. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you're totally wrong in your interpretation of journalism. It's just that there is something lacking. Kumbaga po sa wikang Filipino, medyo may kulang pa po dun sa ginagawa mong trabaho bilang periodista kung ikaw ay hanggang uh, bahala na po kayong mag-isip kung ano yung gusto kong sabihin dun sa aking ulat. Any journalistic output should have an in-depth analysis of what's happening uh, around us. And that is the part that is most important in terms of empowering our citizenry. And that would partly explain why press freedom should not be wasted on journalists who would just be, you know, very much lacking in terms of critical faculty. So if you want to venture into journalism, being critically minded is a major, 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 major asset when it comes to doing your work. So this then uh, leads us to a short discussion on what is journalism. Uh, to be honest with you, it takes about four years to look at the various intricacies and various aspects of journalism uh, with all the various knowledge, skills, and values that you should uh, keep in mind. But Lambeth, uh, in his book, uh, Committed Journalism and Ethic for the Profession, mentions five uh, basic principles of journalism practice. Of course, these are truth-telling, so that's self-explanatory. Uh, in the age of fake news, uh, we have an inherent bias for the truth, right? And when we talk about truth, you talk about two kinds of accuracy here. The factual accuracy, uh, which means faithfulness to the data that you're able to gather. And of course, contextual accuracy. And this is where critical analysis uh, becomes very important because contextualization means you have to make sense of the data that you're able to gather. So you're able to provide information which is defined as the data plus analysis. So that's where factual and contextual accuracy becomes very important in truth-telling. You cannot compromise one for the other. It should be both. Second, justice. So justice is also the same as fairness. So you have to give due justice, not just to your sources, but also to your public, to your editors, uh, and all that. But the bottom line when it comes to justice is you have to be fair to all sides. You have to get all possible sides of the issue and uh, you should not let uh, your personal emotions get in the way of uh, your coverage. So you may not like the source of information, but if the source of information is important and he or she is telling the truth, then you would have to quote that particular uh, source of information. Humaneness is also very important. Humaneness in the sense that you treat everybody as human beings worthy of respect. Kumbaga sa wikang Filipino, kahit na kahayop-hayop pa na talaga yung mga ini-interview mo, kahit na inis na inis ka na sa kanila, kailangan pa rin silang tratuhin bilang tao. Kasi sa pagkakaalam ko, tao naman yata sila. Diba? So ganun dapat yung ating pagtingin po sa usapin ng humaneness. Number four, stewardship. You treat yourself as a role model, especially for other journalists out there. So what does that mean? Of course, we go back to the normative standards of the profession. So if you're a journalist, you don't take advantage of a fellow journalist. You don't take advantage of uh, your position as a journalist and you try to maximize it by flexing your press card uh, at every oppor opportunity. 
hindi po yun yung gawe ng isang periodista. Stewardship should be our main goal. And of course, in the context of what's happening right now, certain controversies uh, surrounding certain journalists, uh, even if it happened more than 20 years ago, you don't get your source pregnant. That's a no-no in journalism. So we have to remember that stewardship means that you will try your best to be a good role model, number one. And number two, you have to resort to fair and honest means to get your sources of information. Kapag ka ikaw nakakuha ka ng exclusive halimbawa, ito ay dahil sa pinagkakatiwalaan ka ng source mo. Hindi dahil sa pinagsasamantalahan mo na pala yung source mo na nung time na yon. So, I'm not sure if you know what I'm talking about, but you get the idea, I guess. Number five, freedom. Freedom has to do with the fact that, as mentioned a while ago, press freedom should be there in order for journalism to flourish, in order for reporters, editors, and other media workers to more responsibly perform their tasks. So that's why even in the absence of freedom, what do you do? Do you stop being a journalist or, you, or do you just become uh, glorified stenographers of the administration? No offense meant to the stenographers who are doing a good job, by the way. No. In the absence of freedom, what do you do? You fight for the restoration of freedom. If press freedom is dead, you find a way to resurrect it. If press freedom is in peril, then you assert and you try to defend press freedom. Why? Because that's part of the principles in journalism. Lambert did not say that these are five principles. It's okay if there are only four out of five in a particular society. No. All elements, all principles should be there through telling, justice, humaneness, stewardship, and freedom. Because if you take away truth telling, what do you have? You have the perpetuation of fake news. If you take away justice, what happens? You will have irresponsible practice of the profession. If you take away humaneness, the same thing, irresponsible practice. If you take away stewardship, what happens? You will have a perpetuation of senior journalists, you know, doing things with impunity and you will end up impregnating your sources. So that's not good, right? Even for the population. So, and freedom, if you take that away, what happens? Then you would have a perpetuation of the dictatorship, a perpetuation of culture of impunity, which is unacceptable. So it should be five out of five because we have to fulfill the mission to help in the shaping of public opinion by providing only the relevant information. So we have to remember that particular mission. We're not, as journalists, we're not here to entertain, to tickle other people's fancy. Kung baga sa wikang Filipino, yung mangingiliti ka lang ng mga tao o kaya magbibigay ka lang ng kaunting uh, information. What you need to provide would be the relevant information because, again, we go back to the need to create a critical mass of audiences. Now, there are a lot of telltale signs regarding the situation of the media right now. And sometimes uh, we have to always uh, repeat these things uh, lest people, I think, especially our journalism students, lest they get the impression that these are normal and acceptable. You know, even something as harmless as virtual pressers with screen questions, that could be a sign of repression because journalists are not anymore able to confront sources of information, especially from government, and they are unable to ask the hard questions because you can be muted anytime. And uh, for some government officials, they can pre-screen the questions and they can choose to ignore the questions that they, would, that they don't want to answer, especially the hard questions. Questions like, what is the president doing in Davao? What is his state of health? Uh, what is his stand regarding revolutionary government? It, was it really him kissing the ground? You know, things like that. I mean, those are questions that are not being, or journalists are, are trying their best to ask these questions, but they are given very limited opportunities to do so. 
When was the last time the president addressed the nation live? When was the last time that he faced the media? When was the last time? I even don't know because uh, as early as March, we don't have that uh, situation of direct confrontation and of asking the hard questions. Media accreditation requirement to go to quarantine areas uh, was imposed in March. And there were questions about it because it adds another layer to the bureaucracy and it prevents uh, people from doing media coverage subject to certain protocols like physical distancing and all that. We have to remember that when journalists go out in the field, it's not as if they are careless. Of course, just like other human beings, they want to avoid getting the virus. So it is incumbent upon everybody to observe certain health protocols based on what's recommended by both the DOH and the WHO. And, but for the PCOO to, to impose media accreditation, that's another thing altogether. And of course, coming from the alternative media, I can go on record to tell you that we in the alternative media were very much discriminated. Uh, I can tell you the story perhaps later on if you will egg me on. But nevertheless, uh, we go to the third point. The penalty for spreading false information is under the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, that's section six. What is so dangerous here? That's why I put false information in quotation marks. What is false information? Uh, is it the actuation of a particular public school teacher who would jokingly post on social media that he will offer 50 million pesos to do something to for anybody who would kill the president allegedly, would that be enough for you to be hold to the National Bureau of Investigation? Is that false information? Or of a certain provincial, official, provincial government official who would uh, summon to her office certain people uh, who would be talking negative criticisms about uh, the way she runs uh, her own uh, region. Of course, the imposition of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 is another sign of media repression because uh, the long and short of it is that even the practice of journalism could be labeled as terrorism if you end up interviewing sources of information uh, who are suspected to be terrorists. So you could be accused of advertising and propagating terrorism. Uh, the Film Development Council of the Philippines attempt to regulate production work uh, beyond film uh, was, was uh, something that happened a few months ago and the pandemic was used as an excuse to regulate not just the schedule but even the content of certain scripts or of uh, what uh, certain directors and production people will be doing on that particular day. So that's why there were many uh, artists, uh, authors, uh, who were up in arms uh, with regard to the FDCP memorandum. Uh, I have to mention ordinary citizens being questioned uh, for their social media posts. Uh, there was even a point where even an OFW uh, based in Taiwan uh, was uh, had to be threatened uh, by a particular government official to be deported uh, because of her critical uh, commentary on social media. So we, we are also aware of certain anecdotal evidence uh, coming from the National Bureau of Investigation confirming that indeed there were citizens uh, who were, you know, invited for questioning because of their posts on social media. So those are telltale signs of repression. We can go on. Uh, the, during the State of the Nation address for the first time in not so many years, live coverage was banned inside the plenary hall. There were threats against journalists uh, during the Pride March and even the coverage of the killing of uh, Randy Echanis. Uh, so in the Pride March, uh, I do know that one intern uh, from Manila today was arrested uh, because, of, uh, because of the coverage and the fact that uh, this particular intern was wearing a UP jacket. Eh, ano magagawa natin? Nag-aaral siya sa UP habang nag intern siya sa Manila today. So parang kasalanan pa pala niya yon. Confiscation of copies of Pinoy Weekly, uh, it happened uh, very recently as well uh, because uh, Pinoy Weekly copies are being distributed by Kadamay, which is an urban tour group, 
And what happened was that the police uh, barged into the office of Kadamay and then they got copies of Pinoy Weekly. So parang martial law na yata yung nangyayari ngayon, di po ba? Continuous red baiting against NUJP and selected alternative news media organizations. I should also include here a student organization from the UPCMC, the Union of Journalists of the Philippines, uh, was also included. Uh, as allegedly being a communist front, uh, and this prompted even our own college to issue a strongly worded statement against the National Task Force uh, to end uh, local communist insurgents, uh, local communism, uh, and uh, particularly its spokesperson, uh, Parlade, uh, because of the careless uh, criticisms. And we don't want uh, our students from the UP College of Mass Communication, especially the members of UJPUP, to be, you know, subject to uh, various harassment or even extrajudicial killings because we all know what happened to the likes of uh, Zara Alvarez or even uh, Randy Echaniz uh, during the lockdown. So there are three important dates in the media that we have to look at. Uh, of course, the closure of ABS-CBN on May 5, the, the conviction for libel of Maria Reza and Ray Santos, and the final nail in the coffin for the franchise of ABS-CBN, which was July 10, when the House of Representatives Committee on Legislative Franchises voted to deny uh, the granting of a franchise, a 25-year franchise. So those are telltale signs, which then leads us to trying to explain what the new normal is. Of course, the chilling effect is very much there. Uh, we see targeted harassment, not just against ABS-CBN, uh, but also Rappler. And uh, of course, a few years ago, we all know what uh, the Philippine Daily Inquirer went through. Uh, the three of them, incidentally, were the subject of the State of the Nation address of Duterte way back in 2017. So the chilling effect has been very much around, uh, even before the lockdown, but it's been further exacerbated during the lockdown, uh, which then leads us to the next point, about the weaponization of laws and the bureaucracy because that's what's happening. Libel is supposed to be, in theory, a form of check and balance against the media, but right now it's being used to harass and intimidate, uh, similar to what uh, Reza and Santos of Rappler uh, are going through at the moment when they were convicted and I understand it's still on appeal. Of course, there is the intensified culture of impunity uh, because of the signs of media repression that we talked about a while ago, as well as the legalized reign uh, of tyranny under the Duterte administration. So he is trying to do what he wants, and uh, it doesn't help that uh, things are not so transparent at the moment, uh, given the limited access uh, to information. It's not just because of the pandemic, but rather a conscious effort on the part of the administration to make sure that information uh, would not be too transparent uh, to the media, uh, which would then be forwarded uh, to the audiences. So that would partly explain why uh, government officials are not very willing to provide Duterte the space to address the media or even him being in the presence of uh, journalists uh, in a live press conference. So that's why they don't want that. Of course, reclaiming responsibility would be the key point uh, in any discussion on press freedom and media freedom. Uh, what's unacceptable would be subjective bias. Uh, we try to avoid uh, that because we cannot let emotions get in the way of our coverage, as I said. But what's acceptable uh, in theory would be the inherent bias for the truth. I mean, that's part of the principles of journalism, as mentioned by Lambert. And if you look at certain journalistic outputs, editorials, for example, are inherently biased for or against certain issues because an editorial cannot be neutral. If, he, if you are neutral, you are not an editorial. You are not writing an editorial. So try your best to have a, a deep analysis of burning issues and from there you have to take a stand. Investigative reports are inherently against wrongdoing, whether it's corruption, abuse of power, 
uh, or any other aspects of wrongdoing, uh, you have to take a stand. You, a, a reporter, an investigative journalist, cannot uh, operate on the assumption that I am neither for nor against a certain wrongdoing. The fact that you chose to be an investigative reporter means that you want to expose things that are wrong and to promote what is right. That's what in investigative journalism should be all about. And of course, all journalistic outputs are inherently against fake news. So that would partly explain why, uh, as many journalism educators may have told us, neutrality is a myth uh, in terms of journalism practice. So at the end of the day, when you want to talk about the reaffirmation of media freedom, it's a tough balancing act uh, for the journalists right now. I have to be honest with you, under the Duterte administration, these are very, very challenging times. We have to assert while reporting because as mentioned a while ago, in the absence of freedom, it's our collective responsibility to fight for freedom. There has to be creative actions due to the pandemic uh, related to media related, uh, related to uh, burning media issues. So there can be parliamentary and extra legal struggles. That's why even certain media organizations have decided to file petitions against the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020, just to cite an example. And there were questions, uh, petitions addressed to the PCOO regarding their onerous uh, policies like uh, media accreditation uh, before going to quarantine areas. So there has to be sustained public pressure, in other words, uh, through continuous coverage of freedom-related issues. So that's why even us, even if we're not involved in media or journalism, we still need to call out media for, their, for the irrelevance of their content sometimes. Uh, sometimes you would wonder why certain news media organizations would choose to write about trivia or fluff when in fact uh, there are more serious issues that should be the focus of uh, national discourse. So we have to sustain public pressure, not just on government, but also on media to be more responsible in their reportage. And of course, we have short-term and long-term goals here. Uh, part of the agenda of journalists right now would be to junk the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. And of course, uh, the 25-year franchise for ABS-CBN remains a continuing struggle. Just because uh, Congress or even Duterte have decided that uh, they want to get rid of the oligopoly, that's the Lopez, uh, it doesn't mean that the 25-year franchise uh, for ABS-CBN will be a dead issue already. Of course not. Remember that for 14 years, from 1972 to 1986, ABS-CBN was off the air. We cannot let another 14 years to pass uh, for ABS-CBN to uh, regain its, uh, you know, airtime uh, on television and ra radio. We have to push uh, for its uh, granting of franchise. And of course, pushing for the acquittal of Reza and Santos. Just because they've been convicted already by the lower court, it doesn't mean that uh, it's already a done deal or that it's already a lost cause. Of course not. We will still uh, make sure that uh, people won't forget uh, these signs of media repression and uh, we will assert uh, what's right. Uh, and what would be right? In terms of the long-term uh, aspirations, we want to decriminalize libel uh, so that uh, it's not weaponized anymore. We want to denounce red baiting, hopefully put an end to it, uh, along with uh, ending the culture of impunity and making sure that just like the Marcos years from 1972 to 1986, right now, we fight tyranny. Why are we fighting tyranny? Because that's the right thing to do, because tyranny goes against press freedom. So that's why there are certain elements of activism that are being incorporated into journalism right now. And sometimes you would even argue that the kind of journalism necessary during the time of tyranny is activism, basically. So there are various schools of thought uh, that we could talk about uh, later on regarding the dichotomy between journalism and activism. 
but uh, perhaps we would we will reserve that during the open forum. So that's all I have to say for now. And uh, thank you for listening. And I look forward to questions later on. Maraming salamat po. Pabuhay po tayong lahat. Maraming salamat, Professor Danny Arao, for that insightful presentation given your limited time. Um, hopefully, uh, some of those of uh, uh, this sharing during the open forum will be more um, um, more time to do that. Uh, at this point, uh, let us see if uh, uh, Carolyn Ardila is ready because she has an intermittent um, internet connection in, in Davao. So if she's not ready, we proceed on to another award-winning journalist, uh, an educator as well, like Sir Danny. Uh, let me just hear if this is okay or Carol or Dita Carol, as I would call her always. Um, Here. Uh Ariel, nakapasok na si Ma'am Carol. All right, very good. So again, we thank Professor Danny Aro for that first presentation. Please hold on to your questions because the open forum will be after all three presentations. All right. So at this point, let me just call another credible resource person, um, Dan Chow, um, who is going to talk about the Mindanao narrative in the time of the pandemic. She is Carolyn Ardilias, or Tita Carol, is editor-in-chief of Minda News, the news service arm of the Mindanao Institute of Journalism. The institute was organized in 2001, initially as a media cooperative with the Mindanao-based journalist who used to write for National Broadsheet, where she was Mindanao bureau chief. Tita Carol has uh, extensively covered Mindanao's many faces and facets, its conflicts and peace processes. She is a, an award-winning journalist at that. She is a recipient of several national awards, including the Catholic Mass Media Awards for Best News Reporting, the Jaime V. Ongpin Awards for Investigative Journalism, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Titus Bransma Philippines, the Hildegard Award from the Women from, oh, Award for Women from St. Scholastica's College, the Investigative Journalist of the Year Award from the Rotary Club of Manila, the Marshall McLuhan Prize from the Canadian Embassy, the Gawad Atta Peace Awards from the Rotary Club of Fort William Paso Global, and the 2019 Glory Award for Journalism from the University of the Philippines College of Mass Communication Alumni Association in UP Dilemantis. Welcome, Caroline Argilias from Minda News. Tafara, are you there? Are you ready? Nag free, yeah. Nag free. Sorry. Okay. Go. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Over to you, Tita Ka. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, maayong hapon gikan din ni sa Mindanao. Uh, I'm sorry, I suffered some technical problems about the PowerPoint, so uh, let me begin by giving a brief picture of where Mindanao is in the national narrative. We are 27 provinces, 33 cities, 422 towns, and 10,084 barangays out of the country's 81 provinces, 145 cities, 1,489 towns, and 42,045 barangays. Our population of 24 million as of the 2015 census is 23.9% of the country's 100 million, although the 2020 statistics would be much more than that. Out of 61.8 million registered voters in the 2019 elections, Mindanao accounted for 14.4 million or 23.3%. Mention Mindanao, and to this day, it still equates to violence, wars, bombings, massacres, kidnappings. Although that is not our everyday Mindanao, that is our dominant image in the national narrative. That is also partly because we are home to more than half of the country's armed forces, 
We have five of the country's 11 army divisions, the first in Labangan, Sambuanga del Sur, and the 11th in Mindanao, activated in December 2018 in Holo, Sulu. We are home to majority of the New People's Army, home to the Moro Liberation Fronts of the both Moro National Liberation Front and Moro Islamic Liberation Front have signed peace agreements with the government. And we are home to violent extremists such as the Abu Sayyaf, Bangsa Moro Islamic Freedom Fighters, and the Maute Group. For a time, we were also home to military rebels. Poverty has been often cited as among the reasons behind the little and big wars here in Mindanao. But that is just one of the many reasons. Think neglect. Think corruption. Think asserting right to self-determination. Think injustice, whether historical, transitional, or recent. And think of Mindanao's rich natural resources. Gold, silver, copper, nickel, natural gas. We even have uranium, they say rich fishing grounds, rich agricultural lands. The late Senator Aquilino Pimentel, in a privileged speech sometime in the late 1980s, referred to Mindanao as, quote, the country's cash cow that gets only dog food, close quote. In the last 20 years, at the start of the new millennium, nearly a million persons, nearly a million Mindanaoans, were displaced in South Central Mindanao due to the all-out war waged by President Joseph Estrada in 2000, both in the mainland against the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the islands in Basilan and Sulu against the Abu Sayyaf. When President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo took over in January 2001, 2001 she vowed an all-out peace only to wage yet another war against the MILF in 2003 that displaced around half a million residents. And just as her administration was about to sign a memorandum of agreement on ancestral domain in 2008 with the MILF in Kuala Lumpur, the signatories who arrived in the evening of August 4 to sign the agreement the next day found out inside the aircraft when they landed and opened their mobile phones that the Supreme Court had issued a temporary restraining order barring them from signing. The aborted signing triggered yet another episode of armed confrontation that again displaced hundreds of thousands of Mindanaoans. The list of bad news that made it to the national headlines in the last two decades is a long list, but to cite a few, the Ampatuan Massacre of 2009, Typhoon Sendong in 2011, Super Typhoon Pablo in 2012, Mama Sapano Tragedy in 2015, Marawi Siege in 2017, Olo Cathedral Bombings in 2019, Closure of Lumad Schools in 2019, Series of Above Magnitude 6 Quakes in 2019, and recently the June 29 killing of soldiers by policemen in Holo, the twin blasts in Holo on August 24, and the massacre of nine Moro farmers in Kabaka, North Cotabato, on August 29. The list of good news that made it to the national headlines is a short list, and that includes the signing of the Framework Agreement on the Bangsamoro in 2012, the Comprehensive Agreement in 2014, the installation of Mindanao's first cardinal, the election of the first Mindanaoan president in 2016, the ratification of the organic law for the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao in 2019, and the establishment of the Bangsamoro Region in the same year. The verdict on the Ampatuan Massacre in 2019, oh, and the series of victories of boxing icon Manny Pacquiao. There used to be only three kinds of Mindanao stories that made it to the national headlines. Violence, disasters, celestial phenomena like a total solar eclipse, and in the new millennium, there will be two more, Pacquiao and Duterte. With that as backdrop, let us now talk about Mindanao in the time of the pandemic. Like the rest of the country, 
Mindanao is facing such a huge problem related to COVID-19, and I do not refer only to the cases of COVID-19 positives here, but also on the impact on the economy. Thousands have lost their jobs and livelihood. Davao City's Marco Polo Hotel, for example, closed down in mid-June. Smaller establishments could no longer afford to pay for office space and salaries. Musicians in Cagayan de Oro, who used to earn much from playing gigs in the city's hotels and pubs, have resorted to busking near City Hall, performing while awaiting donations from passersby, and selling food items they cooked or baked. When bartering goods became a hit in Davao City, you could see on Facebook what goods were being traded, bags in exchange for food or alcohol, not the drink as there is a liquor ban here, but alcohol, the disinfectant. But here was also a mother bartering what would have been a week's ration of canned goods or a can of milk for her baby. A father bartering a ration of canned goods in exchange for ingredients for spaghetti to fulfill the birthday wish of a son who was turning seven in a few days. The boy ended up having a birthday feast as people responded with donations of spaghetti ice cream, burgers, and other birthday treats, including decorations. There are mental health issues to deal with as people cope with joblessness and grapple with the reality of having no food on the table, of loneliness having been disallowed to leave home when the restrictions eased a bit. Many went to their doctors complaining of so many things, but with lab results showing nothing was wrong with them. In an urban poor village, neighbors are counting how many are talking among themselves, sorry, talking to themselves, or are sent to a mental institution. And with the opening of school initially in August, but reset to October, the problem remains on what is the best method of learning. If there is no internet connection in the area, choose radio, television, or modules. A modular approach, however, presupposes that the parents are literate. In a school in Datu Hofer, Maguindanao, for example, a principal admits around 85% of the parents are illiterate. Reporting on COVID-19, especially in the early days of the lockdowns, was particularly difficult given the restrictions on movement and press briefings were done virtually. At the onset, it took a long time for the Department of Health Regional Office in Davao to release vital information that the public needed to know. It was frustrating, especially because you could not storm their office due to the lockdowns. But one had to continuously assert to get these figures. We wrote several letters to the DOH Regional Office through our media loop demanding the release of case histories of the COVID-19 positives, aside from the numbers they were releasing, repeatedly telling them that the public has the right to know and repeatedly reminding them that transparency saves lives. When the lockdown restrictions were eased, the arrival from Manila and elsewhere of residents stranded there or have no more jobs there led to a surge in COVID-19 cases, prompting several local government officials to ask the national government to ensure that those who return have undergone the necessary health protocols from point of departure to prevent the spread of the highly contagious disease in the receiving areas. We are still counting how many of those who spent several nights at the Jampak Rizal Memorial Sports Complex in Metro Manila, who were waiting for their ride home by bus or by boat, have tested positive. What is clear is that Dinagat Islands Province, the lone Mindanao province with zero COVID-19 case for five months, recorded its first seven positives on August 22. The Provincial Interagency Task Force said that since July 31, the province had welcomed home at least 200 locally stranded individuals who were among those who gathered at the Rizal Memorial Park 
sorry, Rizal Memorial Stadium in Manila. Dinagat, however, had enough time to prepare for the arrivals. We are not over the hump. We have not flattened the curve. Our cases are still rising. And out of Mindanao's 27 provinces and 33 cities, Iligan has been placed under modified enhanced community quarantine from September 1 to 30, while the rest are under modified general community quarantine. Local government units have turned to social media for their announcements and executive orders. Photographs flood their Facebook pages. Some update their constituents regularly via radio or Facebook Live. The challenges in reporting COVID-19 are not only about the difficulties reporters face. A major difficulty that is often glossed over is the survival of media entities. Several community papers in Mindanao have totally ceased operations. Mindanao Observer in Dipolog, Sun Star in Cagayan de Oro, Mindanao Daily Mirror in Davao City. A number of dailies turned to digital platforms during the first few months. Some have resumed print operations, but with less frequency. Twice or thrice or even weekly and reduced number of pages. Among the dailies that resumed operations, Mindanao Times has been printing daily since July, July 3, but with fewer pages. Uh, I think Times is the lone Mindanao daily that still prints every day. Sunstar Davao uh, prints six times a week. Two other community papers in Mindanao resumed printing in June and July, but with le less frequency. One editorial staff has continued to maintain its online publication voluntarily for the love of journalism and for the love of company. The impact of the pandemic and the lockdowns has adversely affected media operations. Are you looking for a real press freedom killer? COVID-19 is. Editor-in-Chief of the 31-year-old Mindanao Gold Star Daily in Cagayan de Oro City told me in May. The pandemic has also affected radio stations in Mindanao. Income has dropped by as much as 50%. Three community stations went off air in April due to labor problems even before the pandemic. In some parts of Mindanao, red tagging of journalists is also a major concern. Ironically, the death of the regional television stations in Mindanao is a death in the media industry that cannot be traced to the pandemic, but to politics. The May 5 order of the National Telecommunications Commission for ABS-CBN to stop operations has affected much the flow of information to the majority in Mindanao. In many areas in Mindanao, access to television is only through the free ABS-CBN channel. While the network has continued reporting via TV Patrol National and the local TV Patrol delivered in the language best understood in their areas, only those who have internet connection or have money to spend on data or have cable TV can access the news. But access even to the live screen regional TV patrols Mondays to Fridays is no longer possible because when the House Committee on Legislative Franchises and House leaders voted to deny the franchise of ABS-CBN, it also effectively killed several of its programs and its reg regional stations. The four regional stations of ABS-CBN in Mindanao, Southern Mindanao Station in Davao City, North Mindanao Station in Cagayan de Oro, Zamboanga Station in Zamboanga City, and South Central Mindanao Station in General Santos City ceased operations at the end of office hours last Monday, August 31, along with the rest of the regional stations nationwide. Their last episodes were last Friday were aired on Friday last week. In Mindanao, ABS-CBN has the widest reach. 
ABS-CBN North Mindanao, even richest parts of Bohol, Sikihor, and Negros in the Visayas. And as part of a giant network, it can easily deploy reporters to any part of Mindanao because it has vehicles and funds. Community papers and radio stations do not have these resources. Because they can move around, these stations have been the major source of news and information for major majority of the residents, even in far-flung areas with free TV and a source of news for the community papers that could not get to go to, that could not go, for example, to a disaster site. The SWS survey on July 3 to 6, but whose results were released a day after the congressional voting, shows that 75% of adult Filipinos nationwide believe Congress should renew the ABS-CBN franchise with Mindanao, President Rodrigo Duterte's strongest support base, registering the highest support for renewal at 80% or 8 out of 10 Mindanaoans. Results of the survey, SWS survey also showed that 56% nationwide agreed that the non-renewal of the franchise is a major blow to press freedom. In Mindanao, 57% agreed. Professor Mario Aguja, who teaches sociology at the Mindanao State University in General Santos City, said the non-renewal of the franchise of ABS-CBN is connected to the 2022 elections. Professor Haji Balahadia, who teaches social psycho psychology and Filipino psychology at the Ateneo de Davao University, said the regional stations could have been the most efficient social infrastructure available for the state to roll out two salient campaigns, the Department of Education's learning delivery modalities for school year 2020, 2020 to 2021 and the Department of Health's public health education campaigns. The shutdown or reduced frequency of a number of community newspapers, the shutdown of at least three community radio stations, and the shutdown of all four regional ABS-CBN stations in Mindanao is depriving thousands of communities access to information that they can rely on, access to journalists they have trusted all these years. Think of the 2022 elections. Think of how the new normal would be to be in an environment where the dominant narrative is governments and a number of jobless journalists may even go to the only institution that could provide jobs as of now, government information agencies, whether local or national. But there are many other issues that are confronting us in Mindanao amid this pandemic. It would have been best if we could ask the president himself about this. But access to the president is not as easy as others think it is, especially now. When the anti-terrorism bill was passed in June, it generated a lot of negative reactions from Mindanao, especially the Moro and Dumads, because the theater of war in the campaign against terror has always been Mindanao. We've gone through nearly three years of martial law, 2017 until December 31, 2019, and we have been told that government has been winning the war against the ISIS-linked terrorists and even the CPP-NPA, which President Duterte declared as terrorist organizations in December 2017. Mindanao institutions and individuals have in fact sent out an open letter addressed to the president to veto the bill because among others, there are other ways of countering terrorism but still respecting human rights. The Bangsamoro Parliament also passed a resolution respectfully appealing to the President to veto the bill to provide Congress the opportunity to review and address the issues of vagueness, overbreath, and other concerns. Bangsamoro Chief Minister Ahod Al-Hajj Murad Ibrahim wrote the Parliament a letter on June 22 
stating his position on the issue and calling on the president to exercise his veto power via v the anti-terrorism bill. He said they agree that a policy framework needs to be enacted to fight the menace of terrorism, but we feel, he said, that the fundamental guarantees of liberty and the institutions of democracy must be protected. The president signed the, signed the Anti-Terrorism Act the day after the Bangsamoro Parliament appealed to him to veto it. At least four groups of Mindanaoans have filed petitions before the Supreme Court to have the law declared as unconstitutional. The survivors in the media industry in Mindanao, or those of us still struggling to survive, have a lot of work ahead. Given the reduced number of members of the independent press in Mindanao, that is such a huge challenge. But it is a challenge that we all accept. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Caroline Argilas, for giving us the Mindanao perspective of context. Again, please hold on to your questions. We will accommodate them, we'll throw them in after the open for after cases or the last resource persons. At this point, last but not the least, it's also a good friend of mine, an award winning journalist and an academic as well. She is a project lead of the um, Asia Democracy Chronicles a former executive director of the Southeast Asian Press Alliance. She is an independent journalist and editor and media trainer. Please welcome Pes Bakalia. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me, Ariel? Yes. Okay, okay. I'll just um, show my presentation. Uh, okay. Okay, can you see it now? My slides? Can you view it now? Hello? Yes. Yes, okay. yes, from yes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so the topic that has been given to me is uh, titled The Lowdown on Disinformation During Crisis. Uh, it's very broad when you talk about uh, lowdown, you know, what's there to know about disinformation, but I thought. Um, I take a sort of broad-based look at the responsibility side where the media is involved. Um, and then um, look at some issues around the pandemic and then pre-pandemic issues um, confronting the media. So here it is. Okay. So let's just try and get um, on the same page in terms of what we mean by disinformation. Some very, some very basic <clears throat> Um, definitions just to uh, um, I mean preparatory to the to the highlights of my of my presentation um, so essentially we're looking at false content according to UNESCO uh, with the intent to confuse manipulate deceive people so um, so it's not just false information um, by itself but we're looking at what the purveyors of disinformation are trying to are trying to achieve now one of the interesting things or one of the much talked about aspects of disinformation is media being branded when i say media the establishment media the mainstream media uh, being dubbed uh, purveyors of disinformation and this is in the context of um of um repressive authoritarian states that uh, don't take kindly, to put it mildly, to criticism, to dissent. So critical reports from the media are branded as um, as fake news, disinformation. Um, I might be going ahead of my presentation, but interestingly enough, um, there have been efforts to pass anti-fake news laws, but there's no law, uh, at least as far as my research goes, that provides um, clear definition of um, of fake news, so um, 
So it's easy for powerful political players, including, of course, public officials, to accuse media of spreading disinformation or fake news, as they want to call it, but without really being clear about just what is fake news, okay? Um, but as has been often argued, fake news is um, a misnomer if you apply it to the media because news as defined is verifiable information uh, generated to promote public interest. So it's verifiable, it's, it's supposed to be accurate, it's, um, it's fact-checked uh, at the very least. So anyone who wants to uh, determine the veracity of some bit of information should be able to do that because again, news is verifiable. So we're, we have two concepts here, verifiability of news and then public interest. Um, and this links with the, what I want to highlight in my presentation. Now talk about this information and the concept of democracy naturally comes into the picture because um, there have been a number of scholarly works uh, written um, highlighting the value of information in a democracy and um, related to that, of course, is how this information gets in the way of nurturing democracy. Um, there have been studies, for example, showing that this information creates polarization among citizens, creates divisions, creates confusion, gets in the way of meaningful public discourse that is not uh, 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 valuable to democracy. Now, this is where the role of the media comes in. Um, with the spread of this information, especially with the advent of the digital technologies, we see all the more the value of the media in promoting what one article, for example, calls shared conversations among citizens, among um, not just audiences, but citizens of a, of a country such as ours. How do we nurture shared conversations without information, without accurate, verifiable, meaningful, um, information. And this is where the role of the media um, comes into the picture. Media is vital to our shared conversations and plays a role in regulating our emotions, including fear. This is very relevant in, in uh, amid the crisis that, that's confronting us today. There have been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of disinformation, misinformation spread on social media that, that that has stoked fears among the people with myths you know being perpetrated for example about covid how do you get how do you get infected what's the real cure etc that can easily create fear can easily create panic and this is where this is where the media can play again a very vital role in ensuring that those fears those emotions are managed those emotions are um, are tempered um, to say the least, because with you know with um, with accurate information that could um, that could allay people's fears, then it serves its uh, its purpose. Talk about this information, and then we see the need to debunk it, of course, which which brings me to fact checking efforts being um, exerted by you know media institutions like. Verifiles, for example, Rappler, NUJP, and even universities like the University of the Philippines. Um, so there, we are not lacking in efforts to do fact checking, to debunk uh, the so-called fake news, to debunk disinformation. But one important, but one question I wanted to to uh, to bring out is: Is it enough? Is fact checking enough? I, I think the easily the answer, of course, is is not. But beyond fact checking, beyond monitoring false claims, misleading false statements, and flip flops, such as what Verifiles has been doing, for example, what else can be done? Or, and to what extent has this have these efforts achieved their noble objective? This is against the backdrop. I'm asking this question against the backdrop of what we see as systematic disinformation campaigns going on globally, but with, um, but you know, right in our backyard, 
there have been there have been um, studies to this uh, pointing this out that the efforts toward this information are systematic. You know, with with uh, trolls being deployed, resource public resources being used, and um, you know those in positions of power being um, being um, tagged as the ones behind you know these information campaigns. This points out that indeed there are systematic disinformation efforts going on going on in in the country interestingly um the w without downplaying the value of fact checking for example even in a amid a crisis such as what uh what uh what is what we're faced with uh at the moment the um Clearly, more efforts have to be have to be exerted, and I I took note of this um, of this um, observation pointed out by uh, the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, saying it's no use simply telling people they have their facts wrong. To be more effective at correcting misinformation in news accounts and intentionally misleading fake news, quote unquote. You need to provide a detailed counter message with new information and get your audience to help develop a new narrative. And Carol somehow highlighted this, the need for Mindanao to have its, uh, to, to, to have its own narrative being given the prominence, the, 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 the importance that it deserves. Um, batting down conspiracy theories, for example, about disease outbreaks, such as COVID-19, may prove counterproductive to public health efforts because studies have shown, for example, that they don't really lower the, uh, or, you know, uh, 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 resolve the misperceptions people have about, about COVID-19, for example. But that also poses a challenge in terms of, so what, what can be done? I mean, without really saying that we don't need you know these kinds of initiatives, as uh, because they are indeed valuable. Um, and I and at this point, I want to highlight what I think the media should be doing. That's easier said than done, of course. And Professor Aro, for example, talks about the challenges confronting the media, and even and even Carol, uh, in 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 today's um, in today's political dispensation in, in the country. But notwithstanding the challenges confronting the media, for example, is it is it being seen as exerting enough effort to bring about a narrative that would counter what otherwise is being pushed by the state? And again, we have a systematic, you know, efforts toward uh, pushing certain narratives that uh, that portray in positive light, you know, the uh, the 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 current administration. Um, so, what's the media responsibility in the time of? Um, of infodemic and beyond, okay? because there's a lot of uh, misinformation, disinformation um, um, going around in uh, amid today's crisis. Media, sad to say, still has the propensity to use clickbaits. It is still has a sensationalist bent. Um, it's still I still uh, see a lot of misleading headlines. For example. You, you read this headline and you expect that the story uh, beneath the headline will support that headline only only to feel frustrated that you know you were just um, you were just snared into reading that story for example um, so it's a uh, it's uh, it's it, it, it makes you feel you know you're you're shortchanged by by the media when you see that kind of that kind of story. I personally feel frustrated at the range of stories I get to see when I turn to the mainstream media, for example, the national broadsheets, because um, often I see stories that are simply quoting public officials, the usual sources of information, without trying really to go deeper into, into issues confronting us. For example, issues confronting vulnerable sectors of society, the marginalized segments of our population. I, I don't get to see those kinds of stories as, 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 I, as often as I wish I would. Um, and this makes me wonder, 
okay, amid the repression uh, being suffered by the press in the Philippines, is there really no way for the media to explore other stories that would make for more meaningful discussions, more meaningful conversations among the Filipino public? Emphasis um, on quantifiable metrics stacks the news cycle with stories most likely to generate the highest level of engagement. Stories that have the potential to go viral, you know, across as many platforms as possible. This is one of the this is one of the, of the observations uh, made by made in the study put out by Data in Society. It's called Oxygen of Amplification. So, you know, pre and post Pre-COVID, we've been seeing those kinds of stories, and we're, we continue to see those kinds of stories that are shallow, to say the least, that do not make for, for an engaged citizenry that could unite us around issues in terms of, you know, um, encouraging us to discuss those kinds of issues, or at the very least, raise awareness. Sure, we're being given um, daily updates on the number of COVID cases, but what's the real picture? And what's the big picture? And what else do we need, talk, do we need to be talking about apart from the number of, con of new infections on a daily basis? So this is still very much um, one of the things that ails the media, I would say. The current media environment consists of an ongoing and problematic cycle. Online communities are increasingly turning to conspiracy-driven news sources whose sensationalist claims are then covered by the mainstream media, which exposes more of the public to these ideas and so on, according to another study called Media Manipulation and Disinformation Online. So when, we're, so when the media is trying to debunk, for example, certain uh, bits of disinformation or giving voice to or providing space or airtime to, uh, to false information, uh, the intention might be good, but are they only lending visibility and legitimacy to propaganda and false narratives without at the same time offering counter narratives that again would, um, would incentivize citizens to engage in more meaningful conversations? Are we still seeing limited coverage of issues amid the pandemic? Is there still a need for more depth? You know, and that, that's even assuming that certain issues are being covered. Uh, if they are, do they provide enough depth for 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 the target audiences to understand these issues better, and for people to be to be encouraged to talk about these issues and maybe put pressure on the government to try and address these issues because now we're talking about it, and thanks to the media, we're talking about it. Um, David Kay, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and, ex and Expression in an interview said, there's a need to be mindful about disclosing disinformation in a way that reinforces or amplifies the content. And I would add that normalizes those kinds of false, uh, uh, that normalizes disinformation or false information. Again, I, 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 I venture to say that Fact-checking efforts, exposing disinformation is very important. But alongside this kind of effort, what else is the media, does the media need to be doing and maybe not, and is not doing enough of? At the moment, we're seeing a counter-narrative vacuum. Talk about, for example, the indigenous peoples. How are they being affected by COVID? Are their contexts similar to our contexts amid the lockdown? And I would, I would say the context is different. You know, the, the cultural context, for example, is different. Are we seeing stories, for example, that give voice to their aspirations, to their challenges, to their needs amid the, amid the situation confronting us today? Talk about the LBT, LGBT community, for example. What are their challenges? Are they being left out, for example, in government's effort to uh, provide relief support to specific sectors of society, especially the poor. So wh wh what kind of, if there's any at all, what kind of counter narratives are being offered by the media? Quite apart from simply, you know, interviewing, quoting the, the usual, not the usual suspects, the usual sources. 
The counter narrative could be found only, and this is according this, to the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility, only in bits and pieces spread out on media platforms, in opinion columns, interviews, and online reports. Um, and this observation was in relation to reports about the Philippines having its record uh, drop in GDP of 16.5, if I remember correctly. And looking at the kinds of reports that came out, and uh, the CMFR was, was taking issue with um, the lack of more in-depth reports. Um, so it, it made this observation that as much as there are only there, there's some analysis, for example, they're, they're found only in bits and pieces, meaning to say it's, there's really no determined effort to bring out, to provide more in-depth understanding of you know, those, kinds of, those kinds of stories. The media seem content to let government officials dominate the public forum, trumpeting their so-called achievements, such as what you know, um, Harry Roque usually does, which so far have not represented any real solutions. As they announced another level of crisis, the administration talking heads were out to convince Filipinos that government has done enough. That's government's narrative, but the counter narrative is it has not done enough. But where are the stories that we need to be looking at that 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 could encourage us to be to be talking about such issues? Um, of course, not all stories are all of, are about COVID nineteen. I saw this story, for example, in Inquirer. Carabao Center chief chief again gets Villar's goat talking about um, uh, Senator Villar during. Um, Senate hearing. Uh, he took issue with the funds provided for the Philippine Carabao Center not having been used as, as it was intended. But you read the story and all it talks about, and this is typical of the kinds of stories I often see. You read the story and all it says is what happened during the hearing, but really, you know, really providing more, a more nuanced reporting. I, I, I didn't see that at all. And one commenter who read the story, and this had to come out from, from a reader. Why is the performance of this PCC, again, the Philippine Carabao Center and Dr. Del Barrio very poor? Because that's not tackled in the story. Article would, the article would have been more helpful and complete if the writer bothered to research more rather than focusing only on the scolding of Senator Villar, of the head of the PCC. Please be a more responsible journalist, not a sensationalist. And I thought, you know, this is um, th th this kind of observation coming from an ordinary reader. I mean, speaks to the quality of journalism we have today. Again, with I, I don't downplay the repression being suffered by the media in today's um, political um, climate, but. Is that justification not to try and do our job well as journalists, as media? On social media, netizens pass around more informed perspectives, according to CMFR, that show up how government could have done more and better as other countries in the region have done and fared better. Why then are the facts that underlie these views given so little space and time in mainstream media and I definitely share this sentiment. If I want more in-depth stories, if I want the more analytical pieces, I turn, for example, to Ebon Foundation. I go to Bulatlat, but I cannot expect that of the Inquirer, for example, of GMA uh, uh, online site. So it, it's frustrating for me um, as, as not, no, not as a journalist, not so much as a journalist, as, a, as an ordinary citizen, because this is a disservice to the public, especially at a time when we need more credible information and the media is in the best position to provide that kind of information. Stories that challenge our notions of, you know, how, how the government, for example, should be running the country, should be dealing with the pandemic. Um, admittedly, media is, um, is, um, confronted with various challenges, declining revenue, the repressive environment, etc. So there's a confluence of challenges during the pandemic. Um, Danny pointed that out earlier, you know, you're being asked to apply for accreditation as another layer to bureaucracy, as he pointed out. That's, that's a form of repression. That's a form of uh, censorship for the media. But again, 
is there still room, space, for the media to provide more meaningful stories during this critical time? How do we reclaim public space? The, the public, it's not just the media, of course, that has to be reclaiming civic space, but the, the, but the, the, the public in general. But what is the role of the media in this regard? I just want to keep, uh, just bring, draw your attention very quickly to the important, because earlier Carol mentioned, for example, the shutdown of the regional bureaus of, um, of ABS-CBN and what this means for, for, for Mindanao and what this means for democracy in general. Um, I, I was talking to Ariel the other day and he was telling me 13 local news outlets have ceased operations. And that's just one, one local, one community press shutting down is one too many. But 13? Local news is a vital tool for, for civic engagement. Stories that otherwise would not, could not be carried or that, that national news outlets refuse to carry are carried by, by the, the community press. This gives voice to their, to their aspirations, to their, to their uh, unique challenges. Um, but without, especially during this critical time, without those, uh, 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 without adequate community news outlets providing playing that very important role what happens to our democracy what happens to our what happens to the need of these people in far flung areas for example to be heard for their needs to be addressed for for their concerns to be resolved um so there's a lot going on um it, it's it's nice it, it's it's important to be looking at what's confronting what's getting in the way of media's work but at the same time is the media also trying to step up amid the challenges amid these challenges is there no more room for example to explore so that it will be able to generate the kinds of stories that we need to be reading that we need to be listening to that we need to be hearing um i just want to um this is not so much to promote this project but the concept underlying this um this uh uh, platform that I helped conceptualize and which I'm not I'm now ru running and it is based on the idea that a lot of stories are not being told and as a journalist myself that feels frustrated in part because I wish I could do this these kinds of stories and also in part because I wish other news outlets would be exploring those stories so we decided to to come up with this project at uh, the Asia Democracy Network in particular called Asia Democracy Chronicles, looking at the human rights dimension of COVID-19. So we have stories coming from different parts of Asia. And when I commission writers, for example, I tell them, we're looking for unreported and underreported stories on segments of the population that are not being heard enough because those stories need to be surfaced. Those st stories need to be put out. For example, we had this story called The Pandemic's Other Casualty, Sex Work in the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal. Who's listening to their concerns? Who's aware of the, the unique challenges confronting this sector of society, for example? So this is just to point out that the challenges are there. The difficulty for journalists to do their work is there. This is real, not imagined. But we need to step up. We need to step up and be able to help shape public discussions, public discourse, not just raise awareness, but help bring about a more informed society. Now more than at any other time, journalists need to uphold their core values and show by the quality of their work, the accuracy of their facts and the context of their reports, how important it is to provide free and ample space for their practice. And I'm quoting from an article that uh, the uh, CMFR's Media Times put out in 27 that I still find very relevant to this day. So I want to I want to end on this note. Um, talk about the lowdown on disinformation. And I was thinking to myself, okay, lowdown. And there's no upside to disinformation. Everything about it is bad, is wrong. But what do we need? We cannot simply be dwelling on what's wrong about it. But the media, for its part, should be should be asking what do what do we need to be doing? For example, do we have, for example, a more pluralistic media internally and externally, in terms of internally, in terms of who's being represented, who's talking to people through their stories? Is it just the Manila-centric reporters 
putting out these stories and talking to Mindanaoans, for example, on issues that confront them. So we, I, I think this is a good time to reflect also on how we're doing, how we've been doing our work even before or pre-COVID-19. So again, the challenge is there. And I see, personally, I, I see the need for us, the media, to, to step up and make the most of what little space might be left for us to do the kind of work that is expected of us. And I end on that note. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Tess Bacala, for the comprehensive presentation. Now it's time to throw in your question. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. loud and clear. Yay. Yes, very good. Okay. loud and clear. Now, okay, very good. There's a question from uh, Aris Gutierrez. Uh, I, I think all three resource persons can answer this question. Have anyone monitored instances where media freedom was restricted in the name of public health safety? Uh, okay. Are you going to answer first? Sure, sure. Sir Dan, sure. Uh, I'm sure Ares is very much aware of this issue uh, regarding media accreditation because uh, way back in March, uh, when uh, Secretary Martin Andanar uh, argued in favor of media accreditation, he was saying, uh, uh, he was telling us that uh, it's because of the pandemic that uh, the movements of people, including journalists and media workers, uh, would have to be restricted. Uh, so there, so that's one instance. Uh, that uh, I can recall. Uh, that's all I can say. Okay, Tess? Uh, so in the name of the, well, overall, the um, I feel that, and not just feel, but I think the COVID-19 has been used as a pretext to, you know, to, to clamp down on the press. The press being red tagged, um, as members, for example, of the New People's Army is clearly a case of government trying to, uh, at the very least, limit media's work during this, uh, amid this crisis. Um, I've read about two reporters based in Cavite City who were charged with violating the Bayanihan, uh, Bayanihan Act, specifically on, uh, on, on the spread of uh, quote unquote fake news without clearly indicating what exactly did they violate. And this, you know, sends a chilling effect, as we often say, um, uh, and, you know, can dis disincentivize media from doing its work. So I, I, there, we, we are not lacking in examples of circumstances, situations, you know, of government doing this kind of thing to the media. Okay, Tita Carol, are you still online? Are you there? Caroline Argilias, any point in addition? Uh, yes. Next question. Okay, sure. Okay, there's another question from Joseph Bernard Marzan, uh, based in Iloilo City. He's from the Daily Guardian, so this is actually a no-brainer question. How important is local need across the country during this time of pandemic? Okay. We, we cannot em emphasize, can, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Tess. Yeah. No, we cannot stress enough the work of the local media. What the national media is not able or is not willing to cover, the local media does it. It, it's, um, it, it promotes, you know, a sense of community in, 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 in communities, you know, the, the, lo the local media. So they might be limited in scope in terms of, you know, the coverage, but the, the work, the value of their work is, you know, is um, is just as, uh, you know, the work is just as important as the national media. Right. May I say something, Ariel? Yes, go ahead, Kitaka. Go. Yeah, this, well, crucial because these are our issues. These are gut issues. These are survival issues that the national media may not even report on. Uh, for example, it is important for us, what I really feel strongly about is that um, the towns, municipal, municipalities, cities, and provinces actually got so much from uh, public funds for Bayanihan Grant, mm. but uh, people do not seem to, to wonder where the money went. Right. Uh, 
when we have to hold our government officials accountable for these public funds? Yeah. Okay, Professor Dan. I'll just uh, answer the next question. Okay. Okay. Oh, before I, I'm going to segue to a reflect, very good reflection from Mr. J. B. Bailon. Okay. He says the problem is much, much deeper. It is the Filipinos' failure to grasp what democracy means. Why we have a constitution? Why it is written the way that way? Why there are differences in the concept of state, government, administration, etc., etc., unless we address the most basic problem, citizens will not understand why media freedom matters. But a very good reflection, something to think about. Here's one question from Jean Ray Trafalgar Luciano, okay, from Pasig City. Hi there. How vital is the media's role in responding to threats of armed violence and terrorism? especially in Mindanao and other vulnerable areas amid COVID-19 pandemic. Ita Harold, I think you can answer yes. this first. Yes. Uh, without media, all we know about this violent incidents will be from the press releases of the military, the press mm -hmm. releases of the police, the local government officials. We need to know what actually happened, what are the roots of all these uh, uh, problems. And uh, for example, the massacre in Kabakan, uh, that's, that was last Saturday, uh, nine Moro farmers were killed. Um, we really need to go deeper into what really happened there because there are reports that could have been uh, done by the police. Uh, although the police are denying this, but these are things that that uh, will really need media to follow up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, segue into another question addressed to you, uh, Ita Karen. Thank you so much for presenting for presenting to us the Mindanao in time pandemic. May I humbly ask, oh, how does media news address address or fare amid the negative notions or narratives? By example, violence caused by rebels, other disasters, and uh, the president himself even. Given that these kinds of news could have serious impact on how the Mindanao region is perceived or viewed by the public. Yeah. Well, I think the fact that we were born because of the 2000 war is answer enough. I mean, there were, we all came from national newspapers. We all wrote for national yeah. newspapers before. Uh, but we felt that there were stories that did not see print or were merged with uh, reports from the defense beats and Malacanang beats. So they did not actually picture what we would have, what we have, what we saw on the ground. So that's why uh, we set up Mindanao in 2001 uh, to be able to report about Mindanao the way we see things here in Milan. Thank you. Okay, I'm throwing in the next question to Professor Arau and I to test. This is from Jean Ray Trafalgar, again Luciano. Uh, how should media reshape to further serve the community, especially in these challenging times? Prof Dan? Yes, uh, in order to reshape, of course, we have to rethink uh, how the media operate, particularly the dominant news media organizations. We cannot afford to be too profit-oriented for comfort. Uh, don't get me wrong, income generation uh, is fine, uh, especially during times of social crisis. But uh, profit accumulation should not be the name of the game insofar as the mission of journalism is concerned, which is to help in the shaping of public opinion. Uh, in my opinion, and this could be a subject of a thesis for some of our uh, journalism and communication students here, the, the corporate structure uh, that informs uh, many dominant news media organizations uh, should be rethink well. Uh, for example, uh, there had been cases of cooperatives uh, operating uh, as news media organizations. And uh, I think Minda News is one, for lack of a better term, business model, if you call it that, or no, not a business model, but it's a good uh, model in terms of uh, trying to uh, operate 
even without a corporate structure. And in case we don't know, uh, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, when it started in 1986, when it started operations as a daily publication, it was in, uh, it initially had a cooperative structure. But of course, it had to revert to a corporate, it, it, it initially had a co cooperative structure, but after about a year or so, it had to revert to a, to a corporate one uh, because of uh, the lack of willingness on the part of some banks to, provi to provide loans for business expansion. So we can learn from the lessons uh, of the past, uh, particularly with the Philippine Daily Inquirer's experimentation with a cooperative because it's not as if it's a lost cause. But the bottom line is that whatever reshaping the media should take, uh, it should keep in mind uh, that we should not compromise uh, the mission of journalism, which is to help in the shaping of public opinion, and we cannot commercialize media content in any way. Thank you. Okay, Tess, same question for you. Um, very quickly, wh wh what is it reshaping into, you know, and, and from what form to what form? Um, where the community press is concerned, you know, a mo more engagement with the communities they serve would be very vital in ensuring that the kinds of stories they generate would be resonant, would be meaningful, would be re relevant to their target readers, target listeners, audiences. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's another very interesting question on libel laws from, he's not from Sydney, but his name is Sydney Joseph Torinueva. The question is, what is your stand in its abolition? It was previously politically used against Rappler and Maria Ressa. You think it is still working knowing how Moka Usan was never reprimanded for her fake news? Question related to that from him also. What is your stand? Yeah, in abolishing the, the, the libel laws. Uh, okay, there are two schools of thought regarding libel. Uh, regarding how to handle libel. Number one is to decriminalize it meaning uh, you remove the criminal component of libel and just retain the civil component. So what does that mean? If you get convicted of libel, uh, you will just pay a fine and that uh, you don't need to go to jail because the criminal component is removed. Now, the other school of thought is what Sydney is referring to, abolishing libel altogether. Uh, well, yes, that can also be worked out. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, even during the time of Aves de Rapinha, uh, during the time of the American colonialism, uh, libel has been weaponized uh, to harass and intimidate the press. So is this a good time to talk about uh, abolishing libel laws? Uh, to be honest with you, many news media organizations are not yet treading that path. Uh, we would rather uh, look at the possibility of decriminalization but if this particular administration or even the next administration uh, would rather uh, further criminalize libel, and that's what happened with the Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012, online libel has a bigger penalty now compared to what we call uh, regular libel or ordinary libel of the 1930s. But if the powers that be would insist that libel should be further criminalized, then uh, we would be taking on a more hardline position toward its abolition. In other words, right now, we're not yet, we're having this conversation on abolition, but uh, that's not yet the stand of many news media organizations and media groups. Sa ngayon, mas decriminalization pa yung tinitingnan natin. Now, about Moka Uson and other uh, government officials uh, that are still not reprimanded for fake news, uh, what more do you expect from this particular administration where there is a double standard when it comes to application of the laws. Sina Senator Coco Pimentel nga, tsaka sina De Bolsinas, hindi na parusahan sa kanilang mm -hmm. violation ng health protocol, uh, what more yung iba pang mga pinapaboran. At tsaka yung mga hindi pa nasisibak, di ba, sa pwesto ng mga government official na malinaw namang uh, na mishandle yung pandemic. So, I'm not saying that we should just accept it as it is, but of course, the continuous criticism uh, should be done and media should take the lead in terms of uh, repeating over and over these issues uh, to the point where uh, people will realize the contextual uh, reality. Uh, I mean the reality of the times wherein uh, we are faced with so many issues. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Any addition? 
Kita ka and the test. Uh, I'll just say this. Um, libel is definitely in the in 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 the arsenal of government's repressive tools against the media. Ramin, libel is a criminal offense. So yeah. So that's uh that that indicates to you where I stand on this issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Caroline. Okay, here's another question from Therese Torres. She says, is there a need to reimagine journalism in terms of both form and substance? How can the media repackage in-depth investigative and analytical reports in a way that will capture the public's attention and increase engagement and discussion on these stories without resorting to the use of clickbait and sensationalism? Who wants to start? Caroline? Itaka, are you there? Are you still online? Okay, uh, over to you, Prof. Dan. Okay, well, when it comes to reimagining, uh, I look at reimagining more as reaffirming uh, the basic uh, normative standards. Uh, not just normative, the basic theoretical, empirical, and normative standards of journalism. Uh, while it's true that uh, technology has changed uh, through the decades and uh, and now we have online journalism, and in the past, uh, it was unthinkable uh, for the immediacy of information uh, to happen uh, at the pace that we're experiencing right now, uh, the standards of journalism still apply. So whatever reimagination we may have should be toward strengthening, for example, uh, accuracy, uh, brevity, clarity, ethics, correct grammar, uh, in-depth analysis and all that. Uh, I would have to stress an important point regarding capturing public's attention uh, about the challenge for journalists to capture the public's attention because the usual premise is that right now the current generation has a short attention span. Let me put it this way. There is no scientific basis to say that at the attention span of people are so you know, low, so short, and that uh, they easily get bored. Uh, that's far from it because uh, people, the culture of reading is still very much around. Uh, for example, when you read uh, Inferno by Dan Brown, that's more than 400 pages long, but people still read that, or even the Harry Potter books. There is such, so there is an audience for long form narrative. So, in the process, there is an audience, therefore, for long form journalism for as long as the journalist would write it in a way that's engaging, in a way that's entertaining uh, at the same time. So entertainment should be in the context of the use of simple words, not flowery or not flowery or sensational or, you know, in your face words. That would partly explain why journalistic outputs of uh, Ihano de Manila or even Itlacaba, his book Days of These Quiet Nights of Rage, would still be very much around despite the decades at, uh, in which it was published because it's they're very well written, they're very engaging, but at the same time, they're quite entertaining and they're, they're very easy to read. Renato Constantino and O.D. Corpus, they may write about history and O.D. Corpus, for example, has written three volumes titled The Roots of the Filipino Nation, but people still read that and they gravitate toward it because uh, the style of writing is not so esoteric and like I won't mention certain journalists and, and certain writers who are having conversations between themselves and the lamppost whenever they write in English but nevertheless uh -huh. that's the kind of uh, reimagination that we have so parang back to basics and uh, reaffirming the roots of journalism and that would explain why clickbait and sensationalism are avoided by the more responsible journalists because uh, there's no room for that when you go back to the basics of journalism. Yun lang po. Yes. Um, Reimagine journalism in terms of adjusting to the digital times. How do we leverage the power of technology, for example, to produce better stories? And I'm not necessarily talking about uh, investigative or explanatory reports. Uh, keep in mind that the that Pulitzer has a breaking news category, meaning you know, breaking news stories on their own have value. So you can be creative even in the way you put out a breaking news report, for example. So reimagine 
in terms of you know uh, gaining more skills to take advantage of the digital technology without letting go of the core values that are that are not supposed to be time bound so yeah to to a significant extent there's a need for that because you have a different audience in a way that you know that rely on digital platforms as their sources of news so how do you make the most of that to make sure that you're able to get their attention using technology through the kinds of stories that you put out carol okay are you, okay here's another question from Renz kevin altazar very interesting because he talked about and the anti-terror act and red tagging. He says, thank you, Prof. Arau and Ms. Bakale. Your discussions indeed merit so much reflection, given that some ordinary citizens are questioned for their being critical in their social media posts, while some of our public officials being too, too thin-skinned or onion-skinned. What can you suggest to the ordinary citizens who are to some extent becoming or maybe affected because of the implementation of the anti-terror act and red tagging? Let's start with uh, Prof. Arau. Uh, of course, for all of us, it's not just ordinary citizens, but also journalists who are feeling the chilling effect. So we only have three words to say. Get yourself organized. Because if we all act as individuals, of course, it, it would be easy for those in power to single us out and to pick us up and to do you know, unacceptable things to us and to violate our rights. But if we work, uh, in solidarity with various groups, uh, then uh, it would be much harder. I'm not saying that uh, pe that the powers that we would avoid us, but it would be much harder uh, to do uh, certain forms of harassment and intimidation. It's true that the Anti-Terrorism Act uh, provides a chilling effect, not to mention what Rappler and ABS-CBN uh, are going through right now. So there is that chilling effect, but uh, we should try to transcend uh, our worries and continue defending uh, press freedom as well as our uh, as well as our basic rights for the simple reason that there's no other choice uh, but to defend it. We cannot just sit idly by and say that uh, we will just let others fight for us uh, because we have to take the bull by the horns, so, for, uh, so to speak, uh, in a situation where the threats of repression are real. Now, uh, the last point regarding red baiting or red tagging. Uh, it has to stop. And that would partly explain why we should always call out uh, these irresponsible government officials uh, who make it convenient for people, uh, who make it convenient uh, to do uh, harassment and intimidation, even to the point of extrajudicial killings for those uh, who are suspected uh, of being uh, communists or sympathizers of the uh, revolutionary movement. Uh, we don't need to look far. Just recently, we saw what happened to Randy Echanis. Uh, he was more than 70 years old, but he was tortured. Uh, he was stabbed 40 times uh, before he was killed. And then Sara Alvarez, of course, an, uh, a human rights worker uh, who was also summarily executed. They both have something in common. They were both red tagged and they were threatened. Uh, uh, to be killed uh, before it actually happened. And the worst thing about Sara Alvarez was that she filed a writ of amparo before the Supreme Court, and there she said, I might be killed. So therefore, the courts uh, should be able to grant that particular writ of amparo, but nothing happened, and that's what, uh, and that's the consequence uh, that befell uh, Sara Alvarez. Now, I'm not saying that uh, we should... Uh, always be gung-ho uh, against the powers that be in terms of trying to assert our rights. But we have to be very, very calibrated in the statements that we make and uh, make sure that, again, we do so uh, with the guidance of certain organizations that uh, we will uh, try ourselves uh, to be part of. We cannot act as individuals. That's all uh, that we can say at the moment. Lang po. Salamat po. Okay, in the, interest, in the interest of time, and having mentioned about ABS-CBN, there's, I'm going to pose this question, a related question on ABS-CBN to Tess Bacalia from Renz Alma, Almenanza. Al, sorry, Almenanza. How can we let citizens in layman's term understand that ABS-CBN shutdown is indeed a press freedom issue, given that citizens consider ABS-CBN 
ABS units violation costs, quote unquote, in violations and costs the revocation of their franchise and not because they are being stripped off of press freedom. Yes? Um, I'll be a bit, um, what? Um, no, I mean, some, let's face it. Some people will believe what they want to believe, which is not to say, I mean, no amount of explanation to some people at least would make them think otherwise ab about this kind of issue, but others, you know, might simply be misled into thinking that this is not a press freedom issue, for example. So how do you dissuade them otherwise? Um, again, this is where, you know, meaningful public discussions could come in, in part through the, through the kinds of reports, analysis being put out by Nabidia and using that as basis for, for discussion. Where are people, for example, coming from with that kind of mindset? I think it's important to understand that. Maybe it's coming from, you know, a position of sheer ignorance or maybe from a firm um, political belief that refuses to see reason. Um, th th that's how I see it. But we should not, we should not stop um, reaching out to others simply because they're on the, they, 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 their political belief uh, runs counter to ours. I mean, for me, I'm all for recent discourse. Uh, I mean, you, you cannot say, for example, that this kind of explanation would be valuable to this person and to all others who are, you know, taking a similar position on this issue. It helps to understand also where people are, I mean, listen, listen to them. What, what, what is stoking that kind of belief? Maybe using that as vantage point to, you know, as an entry point to uh, try to um, debunk that kind of thinking. I mean, I mean, those are some generalities that I could give. Yeah. Okay, I'm not being worried about time in as much as I wanted all of the questions to throw in via Facebook Live and also in the meeting room. Uh, I think it's a wrap for the open forum. We thank you very much, our uh, competent resource person, Prof. Ara, Carolyn Ardelius, and Tess Bacalli for the wonderful discussions on uh, your respective presentations. Clap, clap, naman tayo dyan. Maraming salamat sa'yo. At this point, I'd like to call somebody who's going to do this synthesis. She's a very close friend of mine. She is a retired professor at the Communication Research Department of the College of Mass Communication, UP Diliman, currently the Executive Director of the Philippine Social Science Council and uh, Head Researcher, Writer of the TV UP of the UP Television and an adjunct faculty member of the UP Open University. She is or she was a former president of a PCS, an author and editor of several scholarly publications and journals, a multi-awarded educator whose areas of expertise are communication and research. Please welcome to do the synthesis, Dr. Lourdes Portes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, Hi. Dr. Portis. All right, my God, this is such an enriching discussion. Anyway, I hope I can give justice uh, to, uh, no, and give a good synthesis. But let me start my synthesis by citing the rationale of this webinar, which was highlighted in the concept paper. In this time of crisis, the organizers say, the public all the more needs an independent media as watchdog for checks and balances. And may I add, to provide the real score about COVID-19. The concept note says, a critical press that challenges the status quo, fact checks and counter propaganda is necessary since the public's need for relevant, reliable and timely information has never been more important than this time. Appropriately, the organizers of this webinar have formulated objectives that Ms. Silvestre mentioned in the overview. Thus, the first speaker, my friend, Professor Danny Arau, logically reaffirmed what media freedom is by first defining what is media freedom, via v, press freedom, and journalism. Medyo mahaba po ang diskurso niya rito, particularly the five principles of journalism, truth, truth-telling, justice, humaneness, stewardship, and freedom. Second, Professor Arrow proceeded to identify the indicators for a repressed media, citing actual cases such as discrimination of the alternative media. 
where he belongs. Then he painted the picture of the new normal in media freedom as a result of COVID-19. His presentation progressed to reclaiming and reaffirming media freedom. And finally, with courage, laid out short and long-term goals to achieve media freedom. To me, what needs to be highlighted in his talk are the following. Number one, while the speaker is a staunch advocate of media freedom, he stressed that there is no such thing as ultra media freedom. There are legal and ethical boundaries as well as responsibilities that media persons should observe. Professor Ara was able to prove the stark reality of media repression, as obviously seen in the thick piles of cases filed against Maria Reyes and Ray Santos, the closure of ABS-CBN, the passage of the Anti-Terror Act, the 16 journalists killed under President Duterte's administration, red baiting, banning of media coverages, among others. Prof. Arrow's message is unequivocal. There is no objective media. Media is not neutral. After all, all media are socially constructed and there is inherent bias for the two. And Prof. Arrow describes this as claiming responsibly. Therefore, Editorials need to take a stand on burning issues. Investigative reports should expose wrongdoings. Journalists should oppose and be critical of fake news. Finally, what would be more instructive for us, audiences, are his suggestions to reaffirm media freedom by asserting while reporting, being creative and responding to the pandemic and sustaining public pressure through continuous coverage of freedom-related issues. The goals for this include campaigns to junk the Anti-Terrorism Act, push for the renewal of the franchise of ABS-CBN, acquittal of Reza and Santos, fighting to decriminalize libel, denouncing red baiting, ending impunity, and fighting tyranny. The second speaker, being a good writer, brought us to the colorful sights and sounds in the regions, particularly the Mindanao narrative in the time of, of pandemic. She narrated the backdrop and context of Mindanao having 23.9% of the Philippine population equated to violence, terrorism, neglect, corruption, injustice, yet having rich natural resources, a cash cow, in other words. On the effects of COVID-19, Mindanao reporters have been adversely restricted in their movements as they relied on government officials for news the release of details or facts took a protracted turn with DOH divulging vital information very belatedly, but they had to be persistent. Aside from the difficulty in reporting COVID-19, major survival of media entities has also been a challenge. Some ceased operations while others shifted to other means to survive, such as the digital platforms. Two papers that resumed operation had less frequency having incomplete staff has also affected the flow of important information to the majority. And she passionately said, COVID-19 is a media killer. Community stations are shut off. Red tagging of journalists is increasing. Ms. Carroll also expressed her concern with the closure of ABS-CBN since many areas in Mindanao have access to television via the free ABS-CBN channel. It effectively killed its programs and regional stations. A major blow to media freedom is depriving thousands of communities to listen to news. The number of jobless journalists has increased and might go to government institutions that provide jobs, government information agencies, whether local or national. Another major issue confronting them in Mindanao is the proposed Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 which according to Carol is causing an easiness among various sectors. And of course, he gave a challenge to all of us. Survivors, not surviving journalists, have a lot to work forward. Finally, for the last passionate presentation on the lowdown in disinformation during crisis, our speaker gave basic definition of disinformation, specifically intention to deceive people, and she asked if media is a purveyor of disinformation or fake news. She discussed how disinformation gets in the way of democracy and stressed the value of media, citing the conversation that media is vital to our shared conversations 
and plays a major role in regulating our emotions, including fear. Ms. Bakalya provided insights on how this information may be debunked. Beyond fact-checking, monitoring false claims and misleading false statements and flip-flops, she cited the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania statement that simply telling people that they have their facts wrong is not enough. You need to provide a detailed counter message with new information and get your audience to help develop a new narrative to be more effective at correcting misinformation in news accounts and intentionally misleading fake news. Cited as well with a quote from Scientific American, which states that battling down conspiracy theories about disease outbreaks as a that of the new coronavirus may just prove counterproductive to public health efforts. And this was echoed by the quote by David Kay, that there is a need to really be mindful about disclosing this information in a way that reinforces or amplifies the content. So Ms. Bakalya suggested ways on how media can become more responsible in the time of infodemic, such as combating clickbaits, sensationalism, and misleading headlines. She then talked about counter-narrative vacuum, which is found in media platforms, in opinion columns, interviews, and online reports. Our speaker cited the need to look into the indigenous peoples, the LGBT community, and other vulnerable sectors. She found the writings of the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility appropriate as follows, that media being content on government officials dominating the public forum and bragging about their achievements without any re resolutions. Her annoyance erupts, and I can feel it, as she described the lack of good and alternative stories that are left untold that need for the situation of the underserved to be surfaced. And she asked, what then happens to the democracy? Is the media stepping up? Is the media exploring? Another one. On social media, netizens pass around more informed perspectives that show up how government could have done more and better as other countries in the region have done and fared better. Why then are the facts that underlie these views given so little space and time in a mainstream media? So we need to answer that question. Ms. Bacalia ended her presentation with a challenge to journalists by Luis Adrian Hidalgo. Now more than ever, at any other time, journalists need to uphold their core values and show by the quality of their work, the accuracy of their facts, and the context of their reports, how important it is to provide free and ample space for their practice. So given the informative and fiery presentations of the speakers, audiences engage them in an open forum and i can just mention the major takeaways which include the following number one covid 19 is being used as a pretext to clamp down the media number two the local media promotes a sense of community when the national media does not cover such cover issues such as funds going to cities provinces but people do not really know where these funds are going Perception of Mindanao is negative since there were unreported news, hence the birth of Minda News for alternative news. In reshaping media, the corporate structure should be rethought. And libel loss abolition, uh, our speaker said that media organizations are not yet ready for this, but they are all still looking for the decriminalization of libel. Regarding reimagining journalism, it means more reaffirming the strengthening of the principles of journalism. Also, it was mentioned that there should be a leverage uh, in the power of digital technologies and to use this as a creative way to get more attention. Anti-terror act implementation. Uh, I think the speaker said that uh, it's better to get organized and solidify ranks, continue depending press freedom, call out on irresponsible government officials. Lastly, to understand ABS-CBN shutdown as a press freedom issue, there should be more meaningful public discussion, understand where they are coming from, and there should be a strong political belief and for the journalists to really reach out. So this is such a productive webinar, and I am confident that we will be ending this with a sigh of success. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Portis, for that uh, on point and scholarly synthesis at this point. By my watch, it's 5 p.m. to officially close this program, for which it would have been extended for another hour, but given the limited time, um, uh, whether it's Zoom or Google Meet. She is a distinguished expert in communication and media education, research, planning, and program evaluation. She focuses on building the capacity of students, government institutions, and civil society organizations to design, implement, and evaluate their own communication programs. She is currently a professor of communication and vice president for public affairs of the University of the Philippines. She also sits on the executive board of the Philippine Center for Communication Programs, the P. Gamamu International Honor Society, and the Philippine Alpha Center. She also has previously served on the boards of Division of the National Research Council of the Philippines, the City Orbis Asian Journal of Communication and the International Communication Associate. Please welcome Dr. Elena Neni Pernia. Uh, uh, a very warm greeting to all of you. Uh, and thank you, Arlene, for such a nice uh, introduction. May konting ano, fact-checking lang. There are a few things that need to be updated there. But thank you. Uh, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, a very warm greeting to all. You have taken the time to attend this forum. On behalf of the UP system, I wish to extend heartfelt appreciation and congratulations to the UPCMC the UPCMC Foundation Incorporated and its partners for organizing this afternoon's forum. Of course, special thanks to our distinguished panel of journalists from, from whose talks we learned media realities and challenges in a time of pandemic and the need for counter narratives. Also, such a beautiful and rich synthesis, Dr. Portus and great facilitation, Mr. Ariel Sebelino. Without a doubt, media freedom in the time of pandemic is of vital importance to keeping citizens informed, to holding government accountable for its response, and providing verified facts because of deliberate instances of this and misinformation. We in the Philippines have been in what has been called the longest, and strictest lockdown in the world. Before we went into lockdown and throughout the more than five months of our ECQ and GCQ, majority of the world's 7.5 billion people has been living in confinement. Needless to say, this health crisis has profoundly impacted our life, our day-to-day -day life, uh, our, day our daily activities, for example, how we work, if we are still working, how we and our children, and if you are my age, our grandchildren, do their schooling, how and what we buy, how we worship, and how we maintain friendships. The health crisis has indeed evolved into an economic crisis and a social crisis. In this COVID-19 scenario, the value of media is evident. As a people, Filipinos spend a lot of time on media, and hence our dependencies run the range from the conventional mass media to social media, from television, radio, print, and online media to Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and many other social platforms. At this point, and by way of closing, I'd like to show you some slides about media use and early reactions, fears and anxieties of Filipinos regarding COVID-19, and where the media have played and should continue to play a role. Okay, uh, let me uh, just do this. I hope um, I do this correctly. Okay, here we go. All right. There we go. These are a few slides from a research study on COVID communication that I have just begun for the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development of the Department of, Social, of Science and uh, Technology, the PCHRD of the DOST. This slide, uh, can you see the slide? 
uh, am I showing it correctly? Uh, am I showing the slide correctly? Yes, 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 yes we can yes, see. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, this slide closed, closed media use for news about COVID-19. As of April 2020, when we were just a month into the lockdown, at that time, the most used sources of information were government updates, 58%. News channels on television, 69%. News websites, 46%. And social media, 71%. Yet, the most trusted, uh, yet the most trusted were government updates news channels on TV, health organizations. As I said, these data were collected early into the pandemic. We will be collecting more current data in the next few months. It will be interesting to see indeed if the, there have been changes in the news dependencies of Filipinos following the closure of ABS-CBN and the restrictions that have been made upon media. The red bars show you news. The green line shows you trust. And what is obvious here is that there is a lack. Okay. And what is obvious here is that there is a lack of trust in the most used media. Okay. Uh, social media is the highest, is highly used, but among the least trusted the least trusted. While I expect that the media use data may change from April to now, I have no doubt that data trends on the media uh, regarding, uh, I, I have no doubt that data trends on media that enjoy the people's trust will remain. This second slide shows you that social media, while they are the most highly used, uh, are the least trusted. Why? Because of intelligent you uh, understanding that the social media may be purveyors of fake information of uh, and our channels for mis and disinformation now if you link this data on media use with people's mindsets you can appreciate even more the important role that media can and should play in the covid 19 response even as media faces many problems related to its freedom in doing its very valuable service in a democratic society. Now let me show you emotions of people that have erupted because of the lockdowns. Okay, uh, this slide shows you data about, uh, about the emotions and uh, this data come from social media scraping and reveal that understandably people feel a mix of mostly negative negative emotions yeah. Look, notice the green yellow and red lines these are uh, uh negative emotions you know, and the pink line is the one that shows you uh that shows you optimism optimism is at its lowest you know, empathy, while quite high, is superseded by anxiety and, uh, in some instances, anger. So what we see here is that there is a mix of emotions, mixing anxiety, anger, and empathy that have been triggered by the ECQ. My next slides will show the disparity in concerns, differences in the realities experienced by people according to income, uh, income structure. Okay, there is... Uh, let me go to that directly okay there is magnified inequality between how what are the top 10 concerns about the coronavirus and the pandemic among the top income household incomes and the low and the and the bottom household incomes you know? uh, these disparities should be able to give media some kind of a clue about how it can do its coverage about, uh, about the crisis. We have now more than ever great reason to rely on media for news and information to help us understand the COVID-19 crisis. We need information on how to protect ourselves and our families.
from the wider implications of the outbreak. Let me just stop sharing. Okay. All right. Uh, as well as to evaluate the responses of our governments and the global community. Our speakers, in particular Des Bakalia, has given specific topics that the media can focus on so that people may have meaningful engagement in regard to the trifecta of health, economic, and social crises. The pandemic showed us how important it is to access reliable news that can be trusted and but this itself is very challenging because of the unnecessary strictures and constraints faced by our journalists including the harassment of individual journalists like Reza and Santos the non-renewal of the ABS-CBN franchise plus indiscriminate misuse of social media platforms resulting in information disorder as a last word I believe that journalism education must address the issues and challenges discussed this afternoon. Moreover, we need to extend our efforts to develop the Filipino audiences, media, and news literacies. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. And again, my congratulations.